Professor Bart D. Ehrman, welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm truly grateful for your knowledge, your background, the skills that you bring to the table. And I want to thank you because we value that here at Myth Vision. Today, I want to address, are the Gospels really worth valuing to glean historical data from? The apologists want to give a maximalist case that you can accept everything the Gospels tell you. Today we're talking about evidence that the Gospels are historical and not legendary. 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 For the love of God! But today, we're not tackling apologists. I want everyone to sign up for your Unknown Gospels course so that they can maybe understand how historians and how scholars in the New Testament studies approach the Gospels. Oftentimes, the skeptics, who are part of the community I come from, I'm going to be poking at them today. They say the Gospels are worthless. If you can't find it in Paul, then it has no historical value. We made this one up. It's a made-up tale. It's a total fabrication. It never happened. It never happened. This one was invented by a writer. Oftentimes, communities like the mythicist and such that I came out of will say, Paul says it, and then the Gospels come later, and their legendary material, how do you parse how do you sift through legendary material to glean what is historical? And so should we be practicing Paul's letters or valid historical material, but the Gospels aren't, and we should just throw them away? Well, I wouldn't, you know, I, it, maybe it is the elephant in the room in the skeptic community, but I'd say it's in the, in the far right skeptic community, because that really isn't, you know, there are a lot of people who are skeptics who, who are in the sense that they are critical scholars who recognize that sources are problematic and that, that you have to be skeptical of sources in order to elicit um, uh, historical information out of them. I'd say the Gospels, of course, not just his, not pretending really just to be history. They're, they're Gospels. They're, they're trying to make some kind of proclamation about Jesus. And so to read them just as history is a little bit silly. It's kind of like reading David Copperfield as hit history. I mean, uh, you can get history out of David Copperfield, but it's, it's a fictional work. I don't think the Gospels are fictional works in that sense, but they certainly do have legends in them. Those legends are important to understand because those legends form the basis of the belief of over 2 billion people in the world. And if you just blow it off, like, ah, uh, who cares? Well, okay, you don't have to care, but you don't need to trash them. Why? Because I mean, th these are important books. They're very important books. And to say they provide no historical evidence strikes me as just being um, conspiratorial. It, it doesn't, it's not scholarship. Um, I, I don't know any bona fide scholars, whether they're atheists or or hardcore Christians who would say that the Gospels don't have any historical information. It's just wrong. <laughs> and so, um, you know, there, there are atheist scholars like me. <laughs> and you just don't, you don't just trash a book because it has legendary material in it. When you're trying to understand the life of um, Caesar Augustus, you still read uh, accounts uh, from antiquity that have legendary materials in them. Um, you do. You, do. you read the biographers and you read the historians and you try to figure out what's historical. If your interest is history, you deal with the sources and you deal with them very seriously. You just don't get rid of them because, you you know, you've got some kind of bias against them. That's just as bad. It's, it's just as bad on the atheist side as it is for fundamentalists to take the opposite position. The fundamentalists say there can be nothing wrong in these books. And the atheists say there can be nothing right in these books. Not the atheists, but these, you know, these conspiratorial atheists on the, on the far. There can be nothing right in these books. Look, it doesn't, history doesn't work that way. These books don't work this way. And I think they're doing an injustice both to the books and to their readers and to themselves because they're just missing out on so much when they do it that way. You couldn't have said that better. You're actually speaking to me. Um, I came from that hardcore, don't believe it. It's all mythology. It's all made up. Jesus, as you hemorrhize, there's nothing here. It's all a mirage to uh, realizing maybe there's a psychological reason that's comforting going from fundamentalist Christian over to the extreme of skepticism on the New Testament. I'm more interested in actually figuring out the historical or human Jesus. To me, that actually, I find a lot more value. And it's really fascinating to find out probably was a guy. I'm really interested in discovering more about John the Baptist and Jesus. What did he really do? What did he really say? What caused this man who changed the face of Western civilization 
to be killed. And can we know that? Can we at least ascertain something of a kernel of history on this figure who's been so mythologized, uh, made so much of a legend out of? So that makes me want to ask you this question. We talk about the Gospels being useful for historical data. You don't have to buy everything they say, but we want to know if they have something important. Did the historical Jesus say to 12 disciples that you will be seated on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel? And if so, why should we think that a historical Jesus said something like that? So the, um, you know, it, what, what scholars do rather than throwing out the gospels completely or just accepting them completely is they analyze all of the sayings of Jesus and all the records of his activities. And they try to figure out, they, they, they use standard historical criteria to decide if something probably happened. And so this particular saying of Jesus that talking to the 12 disciples and saying, you 12 will be seated on 12 thrones ruling the 12 tribes of Israel. How do we go about establishing whether it's something Jesus likely said or not? In my view, Jesus likely said it. Uh, you can't be 100% certain about anything in the past, really. Um, you know, but you can, you know, you might have made up the moon landing and you might have made up that uh, Jimmy Carter became president. You might have. I mean, somebody might have made. So you can always come up with some kind of, but you establish probabilities. I think Jesus probably said this. And one of the really strong reasons for thinking he said it Two reasons. One is it stands perfectly in line with other things that we know Jesus said. We're pretty sure he said about the coming kingdom of God and uh, and what's going to happen in this coming kingdom. That that's a long story. A shorter story is that in the Gospels, he says this to his 12 disciples. If Jesus didn't say something that he's recorded to say. So there's a saying of Jesus, you wonder if he said it or not. If, if you've got a record of Jesus saying something that he didn't say, it means that somebody else made it up and put it on his lips. Uh, so storytellers after Jesus' death were making up sayings of Jesus. He said this, he said that, he told this story, he told that story, and it turns out, yeah, he didn't say that. Uh, but so you have to decide, is this the kind of thing that a, a storyteller after Jesus' death would put on his lips? And the answer is absolutely not. Because Jesus is saying this to the 12 disciples. One of the 12 disciples is Judas Iscariot. Jesus is telling all 12 that they will be rulers in the future kingdom. There's no way a later storyteller who knew that Jesus got betrayed by one of the 12 would come up with a saying in which Jesus indicates that that person will be one of the rulers in the kingdom of God. My view is that Jesus didn't know he's going to be betrayed by Judas Iscariot, but certainly after his death, everybody knew it. So they wouldn't make up a saying that all 12 will be rulers. That, that means that Jesus probably said it. Uh, and so that's one of that's really a strong argument. I think there are other strong arguments for that saying. But yes, I think Jesus did say that. Many of my skeptic friends would obviously reject this, and I'm finding more and more reasons to consider this methodology to be the case. If we could step just for a moment out of the Gospels and look at Paul, which is earlier material than the Gospels, and we consider what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, which you recently wrote a blog post about, where he talks about on the night he was handed over. What is Paul talking about? I know many scholars who have different opinions about this, but is Paul aware of Judas, the betrayal of Christ here? Or was there something else going on in Paul's words here in this pericope? Yeah. So this is uh, 1 Corinthians 11. He's, he's talking about the, the Last Supper, and he's trying to correct the abuse of the Lord's Supper in the Corinthian community. And he's trying to explain how it originally happened at the Last Supper. And he introduces this. this the, the, the phrase is usually translated as, uh, in the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it, etc. And then he took the cup. In the night in which he was betrayed. And so that's normally understood to be a reference to the betrayal of, of Jesus by Judas Iscariot. But there's a linguistic problem with it. And uh, it's been much debated among scholars. Uh, there's uh, <laughs> there's actually, you know, virtually a book devoted to this. The, the issue is the Greek word that Paul uses. Uh, when, when he says the night in which he was betrayed or turned over, the, the Greek word is paradidomi, paradidomi, which, um, which can be betrayed, but it more commonly means just, it just means to pass something on 
or to hand it over. Um, the word that you would expect, the verb for to betray is a related word. It's not paradidomy, it's pro-didomy. Pro-didomy, that would, that would definitely mean betrayed. And so the question is, is Paul talking about when the night that Judas betrayed him, as translators usually put it, or the night he was handed over? If he means handed over, what does that mean? Paul does use this word that he uses there, paradidomy, in other contexts and in respect to Jesus. When he uses it with respect to Jesus, paradido, Jesus is paradidomied, <laughs> Jesus is uh, handed over by God. God handed Jesus over to his fate. Um, in the book of Romans, for example, Paul says that, uses this verb to refer to Jesus. And it's not a human who hands him over, it's God who hands him over. And so I think it's more likely that what Paul is saying is that, that the night in which God handed him over to his passion, he, he took bread. And so that it's not a reference to Judas Iscariot. Uh, and that would mean that Paul has no reference to Judas Iscariot at all. He never mentions Judas otherwise. That brings me to your course, The Unknown Gospels. And when you titled this, I thought of it somewhat of an artistic title, kind of like when you see art get reinterpreted by different people who are observing it, or a movie where something really deep happens. And there's a thousand interpretations by those who value that movie's art. Well, with this, I thought at first, The Unknown Gospels was simply a title to say, look, nobody really knows what these things are being said, or at least the, the general population. They don't really know how to approach the gospel, so they're unknown to them. And maybe there is some truth to you titling it that way. But then I also thought, we don't really even know who the authors are of these gospels for certain. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so this brings me to another interesting thing I want to bring up about that earlier material like Paul somehow supersedes later material like the Gospels. You mentioned in this that in Mark, we have Joseph of Arimathea burying Jesus. Here is a person named a part of the Sanhedrin. But then later gospel, Luke and Acts, Stephen, before he is stoned by those who are ready to kill him, he mentioned that the Sanhedrin, plural, many of them, buried Jesus. There is no naming of Joseph of Arimathea. Is this a hint that Luke Acts has earlier material than that we find in Mark, where Joseph of Arimathea is burying Jesus? And can we at least see this as another example of that earlier material having somewhat of a later tradition and later material holding something maybe early oh yeah well no that's an interesting that's a very interesting question and um the deal with that the book of acts is, is that it, it was actually it was certainly written later than the gospel of mark was um but that doesn't necessarily mean that everything in acts originated later than mark um It'd be like, uh, you know, if I write a, a book today and I say uh, in this book uh, that, you know, Jesus did so and so. The fact that I'm writing 2000 years later doesn't make my statement uh, unhistorical. Um, it just means that, you know, <laughs> it means I'm, 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 I'm referring to something that had attestation earlier from the time in which I'm saying it. Uh, and the book of Acts certainly records some information that was floating around way before Mark was written. I mean, the book of Acts talks about the, what was happening right after Jesus' death. Mark was written 60, it was written, um, you know, 40 years after Jesus' death. And so Acts does have earlier tradition. This particular one is interesting because uh, all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and, and then John as well, has, have Joseph of Arimathea bearing Jesus. Mark says he's a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, and in the book of Acts, it's not um, the uh, member of the Sanhedrin, it's the entire Sanhedrin. Uh, so that could mean like one of them actually did it on the instigation of the others. Although uh, in the Gospels, it seems like Joseph is taking the initiative himself. And so uh, Acts seems to have a different tradition there. It's a tradition that's at odds 
if if you take the plural seriously, that it's the Sanhedrin that buries him, it's at odds with what Luke himself said in his gospel. Uh, we have a number of those places where Acts will say something and Luke will say something else and the gospel is like they're at odds with each other, which is interesting. Um, but in this case, it does probably show that there was an earlier tradition, an early tradition that it wasn't an individual Joseph who buried Jesus, but uh, but the Sanhedrin ordered it. They both, um, both of those um, traditions have the same motivation to explain how it is Jesus got buried when Romans don't normally bury crucifixion victims. And it's because of an authority figure, uh, either the entire Sanhedrin or Joseph of Arimathea, who, by the way, otherwise is unknown. He's not a figure from history that we, we have any record of. Bart, I hope you know that we really value you and your time, your energy, your wisdom, your knowledge, and I hope one day to be there at your apotheosis. Maybe I'll write some tell about it as well, because you're a legend. Please, everybody, go now. Sign up for the Unknown Gospels course. You don't want to miss it. It's going to take these details to another level so we can all get a better grasp of how academics and textual critics like Bart Ehrman approach the gospel material to understand what they're actually talking about, what their similarities and differences might tell us, and were they making up stuff about Jesus? But does that mean that it's complete nonsense? Hmm. You might want to check out the course. Thank you, Bart. Yes, sign up for the course. It's going to be eight lectures uh, dealing with stuff in the Gospels that scholars know that most people don't. And people who know some of this stuff don't know why scholars think it often. And so uh, come to the course. You'll learn some things are helpful. And hopefully it won't just be, you know, for those of you who are skeptics, it'll be like, you know, huh, these Gospels have some problems. Yeah. But even if you, it's also going to show once you see these problems, you can, it just explodes your understanding of these Gospels. It, it opens things up so you can understand them far, far better. Join MythVision's Patreon today to access hundreds of videos that I have worked hard in high quality content that are not in public domain. They're only on the Patreon. You will also have direct access to me, referring academics, questions, ideas, or just want a private chat. You have that access with me. Also, I'm trying to do more traveling to educate people from more academics and expand what kind of material I do produce on MythVision. This is a full-time gig and you're helping the community by joining. I'm trying to put together more to educate people who have harmful cultic practices or ways in which they're harming society. We are educating them from MythVision on better understanding these ancient texts and mythologies and history in a way like not many shows do. So please, I could use your help and you're going to get and benefit a lot by joining as a member.